Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us for uh, this afternoon's event. As you'll see, I, I'm not Andrew Carter, as previously advertised, our chief executive. Uh, he's not available to be with us today, but uh, the, the, the pillar is passed to me, and so I shall, uh, shall try and, uh, and guide us in the right direction as best I possibly can. Those of you who don't know me, I'm Paul Swinney, I'm Director of Policy and Research here at Centre for Cities. And we're very excited about um, today's uh, event. So we have got Dame Meg Hillier uh, here with us, who, uh, as you will know, is a Labour MP for Hackney South and Shoreditch, but I think even more well known uh, as being the Chair of the Public Accounts Committee. Now, it was quite interesting doing a bit of research on the Public Accounts Committee, because uh, you know broadly what it is, but let's get into the detail of it. Um, and as we know, you know it scrutinised government uh, uh, government spending, make sure that it holds government's feet to the fire, and of course, in particularly the area of levelling up, you know, everything's been, uh, been perfectly uh, plain tailored, so I'm sure it's going to be a very short webinar, um, not, um, so there's lots to get into the detail of there, but I found a really good quote about the Public uh, Accounts Committee, um, which, which I can't remember who said it now, which, with apologies to the person who, who did say it, but it said it is the Queen of Select Committees, which by its very existence exerts a cleansing effect in all government departments. And certainly whenever Meg appears on, on national TV and radio, I can feel that cleansing effect uh, happening, or certainly at least pressure being applied uh, at the very least, um, which is uh, very much welcome. Um, specifically, uh, the uh, committee did a report on levelling up uh, earlier this um, uh, this year, looking at uh, sort of how spending was, or was, what was being spent, or how spending was allocated, should I say, um, to the levelling up agenda. And this followed on from a National Audit Office report that did exactly the same or very similar thing um, earlier, I think it was this year or late last year, which again was looking at how government um, was allocating money for subnational um, uh, projects and spending um, and what that then means in terms of uh, in terms of how we should scrutinise that and what it might mean for the future. Um, we're very excited to do this event for two reasons. And um, one with a sense of a city's hat on is clearly you know these sorts of things fall very much within our remit and understanding how government is spending money and large sums of money um, on on the things that we uh, very much care about and look at on a day-to-day -day basis and the second reason is because as i'm sure many people know we're also part of the what works center for local economic growth which is trying to understand what works at the local level and what does that then mean in terms of what money should and more importantly shouldn't be spent on um, as well so it's great from from both of those perspectives to be able to to have uh, this uh, event so um meg firstly uh, welcome thank you very much for, for doing the event i shall pass over to you in just one second um but a few bits of housekeeping first um meg will talk for about 10 minutes um, about the finance or uh, wider experiences and the findings of the, of the levelling up report uh, in particular. And then we'll move on to open up for questions. Now, for those of you who have attended Centre Cities events in the past, you know that we tend to have questions submitted, but then the chair will, will ask the questions and, turn and have a, a conversation. We're going to do it slightly differently this time, which is please do submit your questions as usual. Um, but if you want to ask your question in person, put your hand up in terms of raise the digital hand button. Um, I will then endeavour to cross-reference the questions for the people who do or don't have their hands up, and then we'll call you forward to, uh, to ask that question. Clearly nothing's gonna go wrong with this. Well, let, let's see how we, uh, how we get on. Another, another ball to juggle, um, but I'm sure everything will be uh, absolutely fine. Nothing is going to go wrong. Um, so on that note, Meg, please over to you for your opening comments. Well, thank you very much, Paul. And it's a, a pleasure it's just to be here, but it's sad that I can't, we can't all physically be together, but I guess that's partly the new world now. Um, as Paul said, I chair I have a great privilege of chairing the Public Accounts Committee as well as being the Member of Parliament for Hackney South of Shoreditch. But just to give you a bit of a flavour of where I've come from, um, in 1994, I was elected as a councillor in Islington uh, at a time when there was very little money available, but where we were still going through for the period of the eight years and I did that job, bidding for many regeneration projects. I was then on the London Assembly overlapping uh, at that period from 2000 to 2004. And as well as having been the MP for 17 years in Hackney, I was also a minister. So I've seen a lot of this regeneration and economic growth function from very different angles. Um, and I think it's fair to say that it, it's there's never really, I'm not sure there's a, a perfect uh, time or you know a paradigm that we can point to and say, this is where it's all gone smoothly. Um, but I, was given some thoughts from the Centre for Cities about what you might want me to talk about, but I'm also going to focus on a report that we published in June this year about wider local economic growth, which was picking up on some work we'd done previously on allocation of funds for the Towns Fund. So uh, I'll go through that in a bit more uh, detail, but I think at the beginning it's worth just touching on uh, you know, whether 
policy and funding decisions are evidence-based. There was a lot of talk, remember, a few years ago about evidence-based policy making. I think without uh, being too particularly politically partisan, I think most people in Parliament would say that's that's gone a bit by the wayside recently. We've had four prime ministers in seven years. It's been a, a challenge. And when you have those sorts of races, manifestos or uh, leadership bids, often promises are made on the hoof and on the hust that don't have much evidence behind them. Um, sometimes because someone did have some good ideas, there may have been some evidence somewhere, but unfortunately when things get boiled down to a statement in a speech, um, that can often uh, end up being rather a cheap shot statement that doesn't actually mean anything. Uh, one of the ones I remember of this, because I was a Home Office Minister at the time, uh, somebody had the clever idea about improving technology for police officers at the front line to reduce paperwork. We'd all agree with that, fantastic idea. But some clever speechwriter decided to give this to Gordon Brown in the speech as Blackberries for Bobbies, three simple words. Um, and unfortunately, that meant that then the whole machine moved to get out literally Blackberries for Bobbies. And they literally just had another bit of kit on their belt next to their personal phone and their airwaved of uh, uh, handset. Um, and only Wiltshire, I remember, was the only police force that had really got a proper plan about how to use money for proper digital change, they'd actually been planning it for a long time. So that is the hazard when as soon as you get politicians and political races involved in the system. So one of the jobs of the Public Accounts Committee is to hold the civil service honest to the process and to help encourage them and support them in doing proper evidence work and evaluation. And of course, we've got now an announcement in the mini budget about, you know, we're going to have enterprise zones, enterprise hubs, whatever they're, in, they're going to be called, where local authorities can bid for certain tax breaks and so on. Again, lots of headlines about what will happen, but not really clear about what the outcomes will be, except economic growth. Well, I'm sure we all want to see economic growth, but, you know, we, we want to see uh, metrics, uh, timelines, uh, facts about how we're going to get there. And we know that on the Public Accounts Committee, as I know many of you will, that it takes a long while to move from a headline to a fully delivered worked up project that's actually going to deliver results. But uh, it's one of the things that I hope I have a little hand in the next Labour Party manifesto, as that's my party, to just try and dissuade people from cheap headlines. But anyway, I, I live, on, live in hopes, but perhaps rather naively, that I'll ever have any of us will ever have any influence over that process. But um, one of the questions has, that's been asked of me in preparation for today is whether the government really has an appetite to generate new evidence to inform future policy decisions. Again, a word of warning from my time as a minister. I was the minister for, among other things, science in the Home Office. Um, and at one point when we were we're going through a round of budget challenges, uh, efficiencies, whatever we called it at the time, uh, the head of finance was looking to cut the social science budget. And I had to argue that this was not a good idea. I said, look, basically, in 10, 20 years time, you'll have a future minister, whatever party, who will have a gap in knowledge about what about some of the issues that we've been following through in, in social science research. Um, but it kind of didn't really matter to the decision makers at the time because they were trying to just balance the books today for tomorrow or for next year um, and not really thinking 20 years ahead and I think that's one of the challenges that we all work on electoral cycles um, and politicians are terribly terrible disease of ours of course we're all looking at our seats our votes uh, and our government or whether or not our party will be in government so that can be a real challenge and of course in local government too especially if you've got a, a council where control is very tight we would have hung on council and that can um, make a challenge make it challenging uh, to to collect that evidence because you have to invest in that long term but overall the evaluation of government's really poor we recently looked at one good example actually uh, raised by one of my committee members who'd been involved in government as a, as a special advisor in fact at, at a scheme that seemed to have delivered some reasonable results though actually this was so this was the department for education looking at different children's uh, services, different approaches to children's services about how to keep young people uh, out of care or make sure that they had a good uh, start in life. Um, the problem was there were, all, there were challenges up to this evaluation. There was one that takes a long time and you've got politicians are not going to wait seven years for an evaluation, not just politicians, but anyone itching to deliver results for children in that case clearly wants to get on with something if it's working well. Uh, uh, but also there was the, there an interesting ethical challenge about how you did a control group when you're talking about children in the care system and when you're dealing with real time real policy whether it's people wanting jobs healthcare, care uh, children needing decent children's services there is a, a challenge to doing that they actually had worked through the ethical points we thought pretty well um, uh, but it's still quite a, a, an interesting uh, issue about how you do that evaluation in the time frame uh, that most political cycles work in four or five years 
Um, but we, we did um, look at, I mean, when we looked at other areas around regeneration and economic growth, very poor. One of the big sort of flags for me when I'm looking at any project is when they promise they're going to create or, you know, or ask you to promise how many jobs you're going to create. The job seems to be a very elastic thing. Uh, it can be six weeks, six months, a year. It can be minimum wage. It can be highly skilled. It can be lots of things. Rarely, though, do they mean a job that's a lifetime job with a high skill or a job that's got prospects. It's very often just if someone can survive in a, in a job for three to six months. So that counts as a job created. Whereas, you know, when you hit that to we hit with politicians and real people, we say, well, actually, we need the real long term jobs in our communities. And that's what most people need to have the freedom to contribute to the economy, get on with their lives and do all the things that we say we're elected to help them do. So that is a big challenge and, and, and something that we really haven't seen got better in all of the levelling up uh, procedures. And similarly, you can actually look at that with education. There are some ways you can measure those metrics more easily because you can sort of talk about the number of people who've got through level two or level three qualifications or got apprenticeships. But even then, starting doesn't necessarily mean finishing. And I think that's one of the things that we always now look for when we're looking at uh, our recommendations is not just the start of something, but whether they will evaluate the completion numbers. And then you can also learn along the way uh, about why people might be dropping out. So that can actually inform future things. So I think realistically, although we would love to see perfect evaluation uh, in one sense, we're realistic as a committee and as politicians, but sometimes you're going to be evaluating on a bit of a moving uh, treadmill, really, um, or hopefully an escalator, hopefully going up in the right direction uh, and the, on the up escalator. But, but we need to be learning lessons very hard from the past. And that's one of the benefits of the select committee system. Some of the work we do, but equally our sister committees do, uh, to make sure that we are looking at what's worked and what hasn't. Slightly alarmingly, just as a side uh, point, though, I've been a member of the committee since 2011. So that's now 11 years, almost exactly to the day. I've been chair for seven years uh, and I have now outseen all permanent secretaries bar one. Uh, and a number of changed more than once in departments. So Geoffrey Clifton-Brown, who's the Conservative member for the Cotswolds, is very happily my deputy chair. I think I'm very grateful to him for the work he puts in. And he was on the committee 20 years ago and has been on for some years now uh, as deputy uh, chair. And we, between us, have quite a lot more institutional memory than many, well, most of the witnesses in front of us. And that's a worry uh, about turnover. And I think it's also an interesting issue in local authorities as well. Uh, about how in some areas it's much more stable than others can be you know house prices and things can make a difference but that that can be an issue too so i do want just to canter through without going on too long about our uh, work on uh the lo local economic growth so we've obviously now got you know, the consolidation of all the various funds that the government had unveiled around towns fund and so on um, into the uh, shared prosperity uk shared prosperity fund and the leveling up fund so basically the two funds are the UK Shared Prosperity Fund, which is formula based, and then the Leveling Up Fund, which is competition based. And we've had some arguments with the department about whether you should have competition based or you should just allocate it. Because of course the Towns Fund was allocated in a particular way, uh, if I put it politely, uh, a, a very interesting list of areas that got money for things that were supposed to be around economic growth, but we couldn't see in many cases how on earth they created jobs. I recommend you looking at both the National Audit Office's work on that and, and ours. But then, nevertheless, that's now been consolidated. But when we've challenged them on why they were giving money to well, they, how they defined towns, first of all, was very interesting. So they had to define what a town was and then they decided to allocate the money. And in the end, it was ministers who made the decision. So uh, we can talk about that in, in questions uh, if you wish. But um, that they argued that some areas will never be able to bid for money because they're too small. They don't have the expertise. And they put in money, of course, for consultancy to help people draw up and develop their bids. And it was. Yeah, I'm not entirely convinced by the argument, because I do think if you've got local uh, democratic control, you, you need to get together and frankly do your job as politicians and work if necessary cross boundaries uh, with other people to try and pull that together and bring in the expertise that you need. But nevertheless, it is true to say that a small district council, and I'm sure some of you may have um, areas where you, know, you come from areas with small district councils, but albeit it's a centre for cities uh, event. And they are going to have struggle very often just to have the resource because of the small size of that budget. So it's, it's quite a big investment to put in money to bid for competitive funding. And that brings me to competitive funding. That can be problematic, too. Uh, sorry, it's just to finish the point I was making. I realize that, that if they, the argument of the department was these areas would never have bid 
and, and, and if they did, they might not have won because they weren't very good at bidding. So we did need to try and find the gaps in the system. There is some argument for that, but then that's where you, know, you have to have your regional bodies doing their job. And of course, with our regional mayors, the two Andes in uh, Manchester and uh, 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 the West Midlands uh, are good examples of how that could be pulled together if you had proper strategic input. Interestingly, on some of the towns fund bids, neither of the mayors had a look in. So even the West Midlands mayor of the government party didn't get a say over some of those decisions, which seems to me a bit counterintuitive. And then the, on the competition-based funding, the, one of the things that we've highlighted is that actually it's very expensive, of course, to bid, and it can absorb a lot of time and energy. So there are drawbacks to that too. And I think one of the things that's obvious there is that you just have to have better streamlined uh, bidding, but also that goes back to the whole point of evaluation. If you know what works, you've got good metrics for what delivered, you can very quickly ask those sort of similar questions and you're not having to reinvent the wheel. And I mean, I could, if I can remember them, the alphabet soup of funds that I've been involved with since I was first elected as a councillor in 94, you know, SRB, uh, States Regeneration, uh, I can't remember half of them, but you know, there, there are an awful lot. And actually you had to find slightly different metrics for a lot of them. So it, we, we need to sometime, somehow get to the point of what matters. And I think we could come up, all of us come up with a list of three or four top priorities, but you know, I'd say jobs, a home, uh, a good education, you know, those, uh, perhaps health outcomes. You could have measures that would show that you've actually made a difference. And economic growth, clearly jobs would be, uh, and education would be at the forefront of that. And education, I say education, equally skills, you, you, you know, both sides of the, of the same, same coin there. But I mean, even despite us all knowing that we've had rather a lot of different funds over many years, in 2021-22, there were um, 10 live funds uh, and most of them didn't even have future funding allocated. So that's partly why they've been now put into one, which makes some sense uh, to do that. Um, and then there is a ch challenge with devolution. I think, I'm not sure how, how uh, devolved this audience is because I can't see you all, but um, one of the challenges with some of the levelling up funding is it's gone, it, the bids are coming in from local areas and going over the top of the devolved uh, parliaments and assemblies. Uh, and that's something that we highlighted as an issue, though I noticed that now the talk is, in fact, in the House just this week, the Treasury Minister did say that there was going to be an allocation by percentage to Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. So maybe they've heard that one. Uh, well, maybe you can tell me. Um, and the, the awarding of funds, we felt a very big issue about transparency here. Uh, and again, I refer you to our Towns Fund report, which is probably worth a read on this. Um, uh, because in that case, the, there was a note published to explain uh, the 105 successful bidders, but the list of unsuccessful bidders well, it wasn't, was not published. Uh, uh, so they were, first of all, just to remind you about the Towns Fund for those who might not remember, the government determined what a town was, drew up a list of towns, and ministers decided which towns were eligible to bid then or to put in a bid for the money. So they were pre-allocated, but not quite pre-allocated. They then had to get together, have a, often have an MP on the board of the Towns Fund and then uh, you know, decide on what was going to be a, a bid. And, and that money was allocated in the end quite quickly in that first, first round. Um, on the levelling up fund, the, the other concern we've had about those now is that because the first round uh, has... Um, uh, has been uh, well, they're expecting to allocate 720 million in the first round out of a total budget of 4.8 billion. But when they did announce it, that was a year ago this month, they actually announced 105 bids, but worth 1.7 billion. So if you do the maths, you know, more than double what they'd said they were going to do. And the worry is there, a couple of things. One, that if you didn't bid in the first round because you thought you might wait and get more evidence or whatever, you might now lose out because more has been allocated than was promised. So you're fighting for a smaller pot in round two. And the other thing is that they were very uh, clear they wanted to go for shovel ready projects. Every government says this, but you can sort of see why the pressures would be there. Good and bad, you know, good because if you get, if it's ready to go and you can get it done quickly, that means jobs and growth quicker. Um, uh, and obviously there's a political win if you're the party that helps deliver that potentially. Um, but actually what was apparent is that some of the so-called shovel-ready projects weren't actually as shovel-ready as they said they were going to be. So that optimism bias towards or over-optimistic approach to some of the bids was clearly uh, an issue. And that's also unfair on those who come second time round. So they didn't bid because they were bring, being maybe very honest that they weren't quite shovel-ready uh, and someone played the game differently and got the money. So, um, but we're, we're clearly... Uh, unsurprisingly to the Public Accounts Committee, and I'm sure to many of you, 
delivery on all of these projects is taking longer, even if they were shovel ready, it always takes longer than, than anticipated and bids announced late in the year, you know, I mean, I almost haven't quite given up yet, but hammering at government's door, pointing out that shoveling money into a, a programme a month or two before you actually want to deliver or six months before the end of the financial year is just uh, really not the best way to get value for the taxpayer. Um, there are lots of issues around accountability on this, which we can we can touch on uh, if you want to. And then, um, what, what shockingly, where I've mentioned evaluation in my sort of preamble to this to the to the findings of our report, but we were told by the Department uh, for Leveling Up Housing and Communities in 2019 as a committee that it had decided not to evaluate the local growth fund. That was a 12 billion pound fund at the time. It did reverse that decision, but it's not. It it, it sets says to you that there's a sort of mindset that thinks evaluation is an optional extra. Um, and as I say, it's difficult in real time to evaluate and really do it properly and then deliver on a perfect evaluation. You're talking a long time ahead, but there are ways of doing that. In fact, one of the interesting examples, I don't know if anyone in the audience is from Nottingham, uh, but uh, my former colleague, the MP for Nottingham Central, then MP for Nottingham Central, realised that it was an epicentre for a high level of teenage pregnancies and has now, I think, gone through the whole programme of supporting young women at preconception um, and then through uh, eventually childbirth and parenthood and seeing what the difference will make. And, and that has taken, uh, actually, it must be about 15, it must be over 15 years now, because I remember him discussing it with me when I was first elected, so it's at least 17 years. Um, and that's that's proper social evaluation but obviously uh, quite challenging to do but nevertheless even a modicum of evaluation is better than frankly what government's doing a, a lot of the time and then crucially measuring how things are going uh, you know it, it, it it's easy to have a cheap uh, headline from the dispatch box or in a political speech or in a tv studio but actually as i said earlier measuring what the outcomes really are not the outputs but the outcomes is that job a real job has it made a difference to people um, and i think that's something that's too often very way too often missing um we we uh, have had feedback from the government on some of this they agree with some of what we say and not with others as you might expect but we're keeping a very close eye on this because we're slightly worried we do it obviously with our sister committee the leveling up and housing uh, housing and communities committee under the able chair chairing of clive betts keeps an eye on this too, but we want to keep a very close eye and hope that we can maybe um, finish on this optimistic, but maybe uh, <laughs> over optimistic note that we can influence future governments in how they deliver on what is desperately needed and sub-regional economic growth. Let's, be, let's just remind ourselves, it's really not under all of the different guises, under different governments over decades, we still see a dominant London and only the Bristol and um, South part of the Bristol a wider a Bristol area doing uh, having actual economic growth so there's a big big challenge so leveling up great but without all of these metrics and measures and clear plans and measuring of outcomes it does risk of being a headline without uh, a proper a plan and proper delivery so I'm all for leveling up if we can actually agree what it is measure it and when it's not working change tack and when it is working repeat 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 Amen to, to that one. Thank you very much. Uh, I've got a number of questions uh, to come out from that. Uh, but remember, reminder to the audience, please do put your questions in the uh, in the question uh, uh, box. What's a better word? Uh, if you do want to ask your question yourself, please do raise your hand. I've had a few questions in already, but no hand raised attached uh, to that with a button at the bottom. Um, so I'm assuming that I'll answer, ask those questions myself. But if that uh, if you do actually want to ask it, then please do raise your hand. Right. Uh, my first question uh, after that, thank you very much. It was so interesting I think, uh, to run through all of that and certainly brings out I think, a number of things that we sort of find very frustrating on a, on a daily basis is that it seems like this is, um, is worse in an area like subnational growth than it is in health in particular and education to some extent as well. Do you have any feeling as to why that's the case? What is it about this area, not exclusively, but in particular, where that we have, a, have an issue around the, the generation and use of evidence? Yeah, I, I think it, it's one simplistic answer is that it's harder to count economic growth. I mean, what you can determine in different ways how you measure economic growth. So realistically, yeah, that, that lets people off the hook because over time you can see whether there has been or hasn't been uh, growth. Um, but I think, it, so for, for one, one, I still find it 
incredibly frustrating that nearly, if you, met, if you look across a range of government bids, and some of you will have had massive experience over the years bidding for things, what defines a job changes between bids. Now, that's just, why is that? You know, what, as I think you, you ask any of us now, and people can put in the chat, what's a job? It's either, either a long-term, is a long-term reasonably well-paid with prospects uh, position, isn't it? That means you can live your life, you can rent somewhere or buy somewhere or own a car or you know, whatever it is you need to get on with your life. It's enough to live off, basically. And that might mean it might, doesn't a short-term job leading on to things isn't necessarily a bad thing but you then got to measure if it has led on to things. So classic for me, my own patch was the Olympics. And I harangued and harangued the Olympic Delivery Authority uh, about the jobs they were creating. They kept giving me these metrics, but on the ground, on the doorstep, people were saying, my son can't get a job at the Olympic site. And what they did was they decided to do it by local postcode. And then I met people who were telling me exactly how they got around that. They just bought, uh, rented a room in a shared property, dead cheap, having arrived from quite often Eastern Europe or wherever they come from, not uh, sometimes elsewhere in the UK, and got a job and they counted as local employment. And that wasn't local employment. My young 20-something-year-old young men who wanted to get on in and get some experience weren't getting it. So, you know, that's just one example of how they thought they had a measure that was successful, but of course it was being gained. Um, whereas actually with education achievements, it's you can count them. Health, up to a point you can count, you can certainly see over time anyway, you know, health outcomes, uh, but actually, if you get economic growth then health outcomes will help to improve themselves because you know generally the wealthier people are the healthier they are not a bit simplistic so i think that's partly it it's just a bit harder to measure but or or it's not harder to measure but we haven't set the measures on a standard basis and kept track on them i mean and that's 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 talking about jobs as a perhaps a proxy for some of the other areas of growth like investment and and so on but you gain you've got to decide what your measure is and stick with it um, uh, and if you're changing it, you've got to explain why, but you've got to build a bet measure against previous um, experiences, I think. Yeah, and I, I guess on, on the measures point, it, um, it was interesting that the uh, in the Leavenworth white paper, which was only in February, but it feels like it was you know, years before that, now given where we are now, that they did actually, the government did commit to um, uh, of uh, varying extents did commit to, met to metrics and measures to try and do these sorts of things and, and I felt that was probably one of the first times in this area at least that um, uh, that, that had happened. What was your reaction when you saw those measures and, and the range of them and and how well they were, uh, they were, they were, cha uh, they were uh, defined? Did you feel that was a change from previous practice? Yes we were I mean the one frankly that the mess that was before before the two fund the funds were consolidated into two funds. It was a real mishmash. It was it was like someone had woken up one morning with an idea for a name of a fund and just announced it. And I have to say, I won't name the minister, but there is one fund that we looked at on the committee, uh, at one project where the minister announced it in a press release, and then the civil service had to backfill on the headlines in that press release. And this was one of, one of the many that included, and we will create X number of jobs. So then the civil service had to backfill what that meant, what a job was and how many, how they could get what a job was to be the number of jobs that had been probably was the completely wrong way around. And it felt like that before, but there was a bit more of a grip on the department by the time the white paper came out. So it was, it was partly because it had a much more experienced secretary of state behind it, I think, you know, who actually knew in the end, you're gonna get measured by delivery. Um, so that was, a, was, it gave much more certainty. But I think one of the key things here is actually there are many, many experts out there in local government, in, in regional government, um, in, in actually local businesses, you know, who understand what they need in their area. And we still have this Whitehall top-down driven agenda. So, you know, the regional mayors can actually do quite a good job, but still often, whatever their party they can be cut out of certain things so uh, but they do get their their areas and, and and that local you know individual local authority level people really understand what what they need so one of you know you could take the radical argument that you just give local government a bit more money and it'll get on and do it itself but uh, i don't think government's in that place at the moment <laughs> right well that was going to be the, the question i asked because that's the the, the the big thing about competitive pots is that it implicitly or perhaps even explicitly assumes that the, that Whitehall knows best on these sorts of things, which is we'll keep the money and you bring your projects to us and we'll decide what's best for this part of Leeds or this part of Cumbria or, or this part of wherever, which it's almost impossible for someone from the centre to do that unless they've got you know, knowledge of, of growing up or spending time in that area. But of course, if they spend a lot of time in that one area, they haven't then spent time in another area where they're then 
uh, evaluating the bid that, that comes in. So it does sort of get us to a, a position perhaps of, you know, all these competitive pots actually maybe it would be better to move towards much more of a, a single pot uh, model of funding for local areas. Of course, you still have to have scrutiny and, uh, and accountability within that, but it is interesting sort of model that, that central government seems to continue to hold local government um, on, a, on a leash. Um, do you think that we've got, or well, do you think that the government, uh, sort of in a broad sense, has got better at these sorts of things over time, or is actually it got worse? Oh, I'd love to say that government learned. Uh, I think actually, what I'm slightly disappointed about, I don't know if any civil servants are here, but the, the civil service hasn't got better at this. Now, you could say you can blame all on the politicians, but some of this is quite the basic evaluation metrics. And some, you know, so I suppose in the end, though, a minister could still say, well, I think if, if we can say a job is a, something that lasts six months and it's a minimum wage and we can get more of those and I can say, I've got, there can be a real pressure politically. So I sort of do get that. But there's two points really that you raised there about the, the idea of the single pot and actually the actually a side issue about the diversity of the civil service. So let me deal with that because that's a quick one. But look, the civil service is now being moved out of London. That's just not new, actually. It's happened, of course, before. But actually, we may, if it goes more properly, and we had a session this morning about government property, uh, which we obviously we touched on this issue actually with senior people like Beth Russell and the economic hub in Darlington she's the now new second perm, one of the new two second permanent secretaries at the treasury based in Darlington if we see more senior people based out of London that will actually begin to that contributes as the BBC moving to Salford uh, did a good good one great wonders in that region and it can make it can make a difference over time but we don't have a diverse civil service I mean if you look at the treasury um it's it's young and pale. I mean, young. It is now more women uh, than there were a, a few years ago. But they they move on quite quickly because it's, it's a great job and it gives you prospects. But it's not very diverse. I mean, you know, if you look at the number of permanent secretaries and the ones coming through, and there's been a lot of discussion about that sort of leadership in the civil service. And people talk about new people coming to the government, sacking people and saying, we're going to get someone new in. Actually, if you look at the backgrounds of senior civil servants, they're remarkably similar. The younger ones coming through as the ones who've been leaving. So it's it's a very narrow group of people. And actually, that's lack of diversity in any organization. Everybody knows that a well-run organization is a diversely led organization that understands well what it knows and what it doesn't know is crucial. So I think that's part of uh, part of the issue. But frankly, you know, that that wouldn't solve the top-down approach. So the, the idea of a single pot in some respects is very, very appealing, but you'd still need government to have an oversight. And, and one example is what well, I, I always use, we've, we've looked a lot at local government audit, which we're very concerned about on the committee and how, where councils are investing money. Um, so the Icelandic banks was an example. There wasn't an understanding until the crash in, 20, in 2008 that so many councils had put money in Icelandic banks and, and it wasn't, a, the center of government wasn't aware of this risk. We've been raising this again, saying to the, to the department, you need to be aware of where government, so if local government's investing in shopping centres and everyone's investing in shopping centres, at one point, and I've never been able to bottom out which authorities it was, but the, I understand that there were three local authorities looking to buy Darlington's shopping centre, but not Darlington, because they knew it probably wasn't worth investing in at the time. This is what a number of years ago, it's about an outdated example. But that that's something that government needs to be, be aware of, because there's a danger that everyone follows the pack and they're not necessarily delivering. You've also got to make sure that you don't have, uh, well, obviously a mad, bad or dangerous council leader and leadership that's perhaps making bad decisions. But then there are mechanisms in place with monitoring officers to hopefully solve some of that if that were to be ha to happen. Or you could have examples like Luton. Fair enough. It was investing in an airport which helped massively to pay for its services. And of course, COVID hit and then, then they were in a very difficult position. They didn't actually do anything particularly wrong. I mean, that's one of the more rational investments that local governments made. But also you could have, you know, the predilection of certain leaders and councils and, and councils to decide that they're going to spend more money on uh car parking than cycling or cycling than car parking whatever and, and actually get perverse outcomes in terms of health or wealth or whatever so you do need some oversight but i think actually i, I I'm, I'm a localist by nature i my, my background politically was in devolved services down to neighborhood level that's why i cut my teeth and i really do believe devolve it down to the most appropriate local level and you'll get the best decisions you need some oversight over that exactly as you say you've got to have transparency over it you've got to have some challenge in the system and you've got to have, a, have somebody overall watching so that not everybody's putting all their eggs in the same basket and in a debt way that could be detrimental uh, to the sector and the taxpayer and ultimately you've got to make sure of course that taxpayers locally are protected and we've seen too many councils fail recently for me to, for us to be completely confident that that's always going to work well but actually just just another side point on that, I think every major party should be doing much better training support for its local elected councillors. 
you can get to be a councillor now, have no understanding of how local government finance works, no understanding of the quasi-judicial responsibilities you have. And I think that should be automatic before you can even become a candidate. But I may be a bit out of step with some of my political <laughs> colleagues on that one. No, I, I agree with that. Uh, I think it, that's something that runs through politics, is it's not necessarily a requirement for, you see this with the appointing of, uh, of even Secretary of State, the requirement of under, or understanding the subject isn't necessarily a requirement of the position, which always seems... Um, politics is definitely not a meritocracy. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, true. Very true, very true. So the... Um, Obviously, you touched on uh, evaluation uh, at the start, and that seems to be a real sort of crux within all of this, is the, the incentives or lack thereof to actually properly evaluate things. What would you like, I've had a number of questions along this, this line come in. How can we change the incentives? I think maybe both for the civil servants and, and the politicians, in order to get that to change. Is that something we can do, you know, to try and improve the, the issues of the broader system? But are there, are there those tweaks in, within the system that we can at least sort of get a better version of what we've currently got? Um, that's a good question. I'm not sure. I mean, it, I think the challenge is, and this is where, again, lo going local can be really good, is if you're a local councillor or, you know, you are looking the people that you're serving right in the eye, you're on the doorstep at weekends, you're in local meetings. Council officers, likewise, are a lot closer because even if they're not always meeting those people themselves, they're meeting the, the councillors the day after the, the, the heated local neighbourhood meeting. So I think that is an incentive that drives the politician that doesn't perhaps drive the Whitehall civil servant. Not, and I'm not saying for a minute that those civil servants in Whitehall aren't keen public servants, proper public servants, trying to do their best for taxpayers. But it, it, there is a difference when you're not, vis, you know, a visceral difference actually, when you're not necessarily facing people. You can be brilliant at policy. When policy hits the real world, that's when you... So just a, a tiny example locally, I've been battling with my council, which is a very good council, I have to say, Hackney, but they decided to relocate some of the recycling bins off the high street where because people would come and rummage through them and make a bit of mess by the bus stop. But they, they put them right on, on a council, well, on an estate, on a road by the estate, right outside this woman's flat. So she's getting a lot of hassle from people, antisocial behaviour because of that. Now, that is something I'm viscerally picking up every time I bump into or every time I walk past the bloody bins, which is still where they are. But somebody rationally made a sensible decision saying, oh, we're getting a bit of rubbish on the high street. It might make more sense to move this round the corner out of the way without really thinking it through. So it depends what you mean by incentives. But I think the incentives for the good, in, the right incentives for everybody in the public service should be doing the best they can for the people that they serve. But sometimes that's not always the obvious thing to do. So that's a bit of a roundabout way of answering it, but I uh, hope that helps. You know, it's very interesting to point to the, the element of sometimes you can, you know, unintended consequences, you, you sort of like whack them all, you just think you're solving one problem, but actually you create a, a problem elsewhere. Um, which I guess when it comes to evaluation is it, it is also a question of how do you make sure you're trying to evaluate in the way that you do pick up some of those unintended consequences while, rather than just focused on, on very one very specific bit. I mean, it, it seems as if um, you know, one, of the, one, of the, one of the many problems in the system is particularly with competitive pots is that um, there's a game, there's a great, or there's a game that's set up, which means that local authorities get consultants involved, um, and the goal is to try and, as you were alluding to earlier, you know, set out the, the biggest size of the prize you possibly can, and, and optimism bias and over, over inflate, you know, in terms of the number of jobs created or perhaps other impacts that uh, we might see, or how quickly something could be uh, delivered. How sure already is it, as you were picking up on um, from the findings of the report? There's a question here from. Um, from Fulia Ibley, who's saying, is are there any um, uh, are there any studies that have shown the the sort of the positive returns from getting sort of consultants involved in particular? I think maybe there's, there's a broader question here about have we got a challenge around the fact that we have got a system set up in such a way that it does encourage use of consultants? You know, is that a good thing or does it end up being a net a net negative thing? No, I think it's a really good question because actually I think there has been a big study about the benefit of a consultant. I mean, it's difficult because it's probably not quite, is it one for the National Audit Office? Perhaps not so much because once you get into the inner workings of a consultancy, that's not really, uh, well, it is public money, but it's gone into the private sector yeah. at that point. Um, but I think it is, yeah, I mean, we all know, don't we, any of us who've been around this for a while, that there are certainly people who can come and tell you how brilliant they're going to do and, uh, and then actually they don't necessarily contribute to a lot. There's also... I think less in the public sector than in the bits of the private sector. There's an, in a, you know, you sometimes need to bring in an outside body to verify what you've done. And, and that's where sort of senior people get their um, the kind of cushion uh, from so they can justify a certain behaviour, which is was a lot of money, but not necessarily delivering. It depends you know, what level of consultancy you're, you're working 
uh, on. So I think, I think, I mean, realistically, we, one of the reasons consultancies come in is because of the diminution in uh, in expertise and skills and and um, personnel, mainly from pers because of diminution in personnel at local level. You know, if you if you're cutting, you're losing skills and experience, so you can't buy it. So when people talk about, you know, uh, when there was talk about once again building council housing, I kept saying to people, but the challenge is there are no architects departments anymore. They haven't got the skills in house. My local hospital would like to look at insourcing. But it's got contracts underway, but it couldn't even serve food safety at safety at the moment because it doesn't have managers who know about how you serve food safely in a hospital because they haven't got those managers. They're in the private sector now. So I think that's partly why consultants are being used. Now, it was interesting for the towns fund that they paid for consultants to help people put bids together. But that was, again, often because these were very small areas where they didn't have that expertise uh, in-house. But I think it's an important question to ask. And I, 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 it set me thinking. Uh, about whether we should be looking Very more and more at what, what the benefit is pound for pound. So thank you, Fulia, for that. Excellent, excellent. The, um, you, you touched on the fact that there's an issue around uh, elections in particular that have come up with, with things sort of off the hoof and uh, on the hoof, sorry, and um, uh, I'm thinking about slogans that play well rather than necessarily thinking about the detail. Now, one of the examples of that was in the, the previous or the Conservative leadership election just gone. Well, that was quite interesting. I thought that rather than having a debate about the, the qualities of the individual to deliver a manifesto that was certain in 2019, all of a sudden there was a competition there about trying to put, you know, who can put the best new policies forward, which seems to be more of a general election point than an than a, a election within a particular party, but perhaps that's a slightly separate point. One of the things that did come out, and uh, Paul Greenhow highlights this, is investment zones, something that Liz Trust came up with. So the idea of being... Um, uh, an extension of free ports, so actually when you look at the detail, I don't think they are, I think the more extension of, of enterprise zones rather than free ports. But what's your take in terms, of, uh, in terms of, of that? I think in terms of maybe how the policy has come about, and there may be any concerns that you might have, given what you have, uh, you've uncovered about the approach you're leveling up so far, um, about sort of, you know, where there might be problems there, particularly say around additionality, fee displacement, and picking of areas and things like that. Well, yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, investment zones seems just like another slogan at the moment. And I mean, I think as, as Paul has, has highlighted, there's been the, this collective amnesia, uh, uh, you know, let's scorch the earth and say, I mean, you know, we've, we've now seen, for example, you take education, sure start, which was one exactly the sort of project they needed to run long enough to, to properly evaluate it. Axed, and then a few years later, really effectively brought back. But, but no, when we try to say this is the same as sure start, the current government was saying no it's not you know so that's not a party political point i mean i have to be a labor mp but it but you see that you never want to use the same phrase or indeed you steal the the, the phrase it's, it's been a very silly game really frankly in politics you know uh the living wage because that then undercuts the the opponent or you know whatever and i think that the, the, there is a, a, a real uh challenge there and i think that we've got to so with investment zones, so there is a danger of displacement. So, you know, what a company might go somewhere where they're going to get a tax break, where they might have gone to a neighbouring area. So there's got to be really careful thought about this. And I don't think, and the Prime Minister spoke about it this week in the, in the House, um, you know, as a Prime Minister's question, so it wasn't in depth. But I do think that, that she's got this, people can convince themselves this is going to deliver without actually, unless you investigate it carefully and think about it, you're going to have very big downsides for neighbouring areas. Now, that's where if you've got a regional mayor, you might get a bit of balance. But if you've got everybody fighting dog eat dog with each other, you're going to have um, big challenges. That said, you know, when you do have regional approaches done properly, I remember, you know, for example, when Bristol built its arena, um, it was going to be useful for the whole of the wider. I think five local authorities were going to benefit from that because they knew that their population would go and work there. But you're never going to build that arena outside the city centre because it needed to be in a sensible place so people do get their local economies and and that road links and travel links and so on can be a very important part of that but I think without setting clearer parameters we and we could end up with just sort of, well put it this way we've got let's assume that we're not going to go to as far as January 25 for the election it's only well even if it was January 25 even if it, let's say we assume it is January 25 two years to get this up and delivering I don't I don't think that that's going to be done in a way that's going to deliver thoughtful, carefully worked out uh, pro uh, progress towards proper economic growth. Um, but that's maybe just I'm a, an old cynic um, who's been around too long. No, I'm sure you're right. I mean, it points back to what you were saying about um, you know, having to get money out of the door for um, 
uh, before the end of financial years, etc. I mean, this falls into exactly the same category, doesn't it? Can I, can I just say, I can see Paul's question on here. So his question, your actual question Paul, at the end, of course, is can you see us ever returning to the higher ground of evidence-based policymaking, project monitoring and evaluation in the future? I hope so. I hope that, my, you know, that not just my party, I speak to members of all parties, particularly, you know, obviously other conservative members, as, conservative members as well as Labour members, and, and some of them, you know, we sometimes bemoan, is our style of politics going so out of fashion that we, we should give up and just go on TikTok? Um, but uh, actually, as someone said to me, no, you know, with this, with the tide will turn and people will want to see long term. I think one of the challenges, though, is just a very real challenge, is we've, we thought that, that the coalition was unstable. Uh, we look back now with fondness on those stable years. Uh -huh. But actually, since 2010, we've had the most extraordinarily unstable government compared with the previous 13 years and the previous 18 years. And for whether you agreed with the 18 years of Conservative government or the 13 years of Labour government or not, there was a stability. You knew that if you spoke to a minister or if the prime minister said something, it would happen, broadly speaking. I mean, you know, it didn't all go perfectly. But absolutely now we have no idea. I mean, how many... We've had four prime ministers in seven years. I think we're on, tw I think the 13th housing minister. I'm, I've kind of lost count. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the institutional memory and that um, adherent, well, institutional memory in parliament, things that would have been shocking when I was first elected, that you would, if you made a mistake in, to the house, you made an immediate apology. And now people are very loose with the facts. And uh, uh, and politicians have always been full of hot air and uh, able to, to, you know, make things sound better than they are, but actually now it's really quite shockingly uh, lacking. There's a shocking lack of concern about accuracy uh, and and I suppose straightforwardness. Really, I'm not saying my colleagues are all liars or anything, but it's it's the the, the, the I think the partly in a way the social media generation. You know, it, it, you've got to get something out quickly and short, and it doesn't really matter what's going on behind the scenes. And I think, but but most people, you know, talk to anyone with who's been around a while and some of the new people coming through, they do understand proper evaluation. And I've been delighted to work with some new, uh, well, on my committee, uh, more new conservative than more Labour because it's more conservative members, new MPs who really do get that you actually have to do the proper work and analysis. So there are people out there willing to do this. I know very much in local government there are. So I have still, I suppose, I'm a bit sceptical, but I've got hope that the tide will turn. <laughs> I, uh, I certainly hope so. Uh, are there, I mean, Obviously, we talked a lot about internally about sort of how the machinery of government works or how, how politicians, both local and, and national, work. But are there things that can be done from the outside? So, for example, you know, what works Centre for Working Economic Growth is trying to do these things about generating the one, both evaluating the evidence and then where we can actually try to, to help generate some of the evidence through trying to encourage evaluations and training uh, to get people to do the evaluations. What is it that you think that external organisations can do to support the, uh, the Public Accounts Committee in, in looking at uh, uh, subjects like this? Well, I think, uh, as we've seen, actually, with the recent economic situation, the, the voices off can be very powerful. Uh, so the IFS, I mean, always a, a great body to deal with, whether, whether you know, you don't, when you're in government, you don't always like what they've got to say because they're just, <laughs> but, but they tell you as it is very, I think, you know, got a great reputation, but the Treasury Select Committee had some very good people in front of it just yesterday highlighting these issues. So actually, if there's a consensus of the voices off, you do, I mean, obviously there's a tendency in certain political arenas at the moment to talk about the blob or the consensus and, the, and, and dismiss that uh, expert uh, opinion, but some there is a kind of centre of gravity that usually appears in good, sensible, thoughtful discourse. Um, and you know, I, I do. I, it, sometimes I was at an, a, a, I recently spoke at an event um, outside of the political sphere, obviously talking about what we do. And it was just so heartening to be in a room with people who are all really broadly trying to pull in the same direction and do the, the right thing. And the disagreements weren't visceral; they were just sort of like you know, marginal, you know, well on the one hand and on the other. And 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 we've got such divided politics that we end up with if we're not careful with this sort of really big divide. But I do think that actually that 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 centre of gravity brought in by outside bodies is really important. But it's got to be proper. The, the danger is at the moment is one little flaw in a bit of research uh, or, or something that's a bit too partial and the whole thing can be dismissed. So it's got to be thoughtful and careful. What's also noticeable, I think, since I was first elected, is more coalitions of interest groups coming together. So you've got the Green Alliance, uh, you've got uh, some of the children's charities coming together, you know, they, who, um, even things like the Disaster Recovery uh, Fund, um, so where you've got charities coming together for international uh, crises. Actually, that's quite a powerful thing. If, you can, if those bodies themselves can agree on something, that shows that, that, that they're, they're not all got... 
they're not just grinding their own axe. They've all they've got they've got a good reason to come to that consensus, and I think that's that is yeah. very helpful and very powerful actually for politicians. Um, uh, I think it could be very helpful support for a politician to make the right decision and then also a check on a politician who's trying to go far too far in one direction or another. Indeed. The um the IFS clearly is, plays a, a fantastic role in, in in all of this. I think notwithstanding clearly the, the, the direction that the current political leadership has gone in where perhaps maybe wasn't so aware of the, the IFS's uh, judgments as maybe what has been the case in the past. Um well, clearly plays a very strong role especially around tax policy. It always strikes me that that happens in, in part, I hope this is not because it's a chip on my shoulder maybe, that that's because actually tax is really complicated. And so people instantly then look to the experts to try and figure out what does all of this mean? Whereas within, within look, subnational economic growth, it, it feels to me that, um, that it's not seen as so complicated, even though reality is actually one, perhaps not quite as complicated as tax policy. It is really complicated. As I say, it's hard to measure. It's hard to discern sort of what works and what doesn't because there's so many different things that are going on. But many more people have opinions, I think, about these sorts of things, about what they think should happen, maybe because in part they feel they've got a stake in you know, their local community and therefore you know, they, they have a position to take on something like sort of national growth, as, which is different to maybe tax policy. It, is that something that you share? Do you think this is, that is partly a barrier to trying to get better evaluation and better measuring within... Um, uh, with this area because actually experts are seen as being less valuable perhaps in, in this area as maybe elsewhere? Well, I think it's probably partly because actually, you know, it's easier actually, although it's difficult, but if you're an expert, it's easier to look at central government and an economic policy centrally than it is. I mean, you, this, this is a big bit of evaluation need to be done to prove that some economic development or a new, whether it's a new arena or, a, you know, I, would, I think about the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham, how do you measure the impact of that and the measurements are always a bit yeah, they're, they're a bit imprecise and then they get boiled down into simple sound bites by people like me you know because in the end that's what you, you've got your two minutes in the house or whatever to raise a point so you're trying to sort of pick out the key salient points and and so I think that we are underdeveloped in doing that but governments set the tone for this over the years I don't think we've done enough good evaluation I'm saying I'm sure there are good high spots in government over the years in fact I think one of the questions was about um, the national indicators for local government I remember that was Hazel Blears I think was one of was was working with you then uh, sorry I can't remember who said that on, on, on the chat I'm just trying to keep half an eye on it while, while talking to you um, but actually, that's that was a good way of saying this is that was about local government measuring uh, and being able to compare and contrast. But it took a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to get to the point to boil down some of the key indicators and also agree on funding to make sure that that they could be delivered. Um, so it, it is. I think it, that's the challenge about how you get the, the metrics simple enough and common enough to make sure you can do some reasonable comparisons. And realistically, any national body is going to have to have a lot of well, a lot of deep pockets and good tentacles to get out to, to individual areas. And that means, you know, they you would require, just think about it, you know, the uh, the local, uh, ent the LEP uh, or the new equivalents, uh, local councils, more than one, uh, that would be politicians and officers. And can you imagine, you know, you're the finance officer of a council and some researcher comes along and says, we'd just love to learn about this. Can you provide us with all this detailed information? You probably send them away with a flea in their ear because you're far too damn busy trying to work out how on earth you're going to deal with the next round of cuts that are coming. Uh, so, you know, I, I think that's one of the boringly practical challenges of this. There aren't yeah. think tanks at local level um, that they're going to do this. And if you know, even if you did have them, they were, if you had, if if by miracle you had a think tank in Manchester, just looking at Manchester, you wouldn't have the equivalent in the West Midlands or in Liverpool, would you? Yes, yeah, and I guess that speaks in, in part um, uh, to sort of where we've seen uh, devolution um, and the creation of Metro Mayor. So Manchester has got, and even well, and it did have this body even before the mayor was created, it does have quite a large analytical body uh, within it to sort of do um, uh, the crunching of the data, understanding what's going on, hopefully do a degree of evaluation. Are you hopeful that... Um, you know, to a backdrop of uh, alleged alleged uh, uh, trimming of fat uh, approaches might be taken to different government departments. Are you hopeful that something like a metro mayoral institution at the local level can help change some of this in terms of trying to do better evaluation and trying to do more more measured policy? Or do you think that that's some that the problems that um, uh, that are the challenge at the national level remain a, a problem at the local level in respect of structures? I think that well, it's interesting. I, when I when the Metro mayors were first set up, I tried to meet them. I did meet them all. 
Um, and I was saying that you need to think about now about looking at what money you're getting and what you're delivering for it and make sure you get those metrics in place. And one of the reasons I was trying to convince them of this, but of course, by then they'd all got elected and it sort of wasn't quite their top priority because they were already in position and had money to spend. One of the reasons was if, if you've got money devolved to Manchester, say, for health, so it's devolved directly from government so that you can deal with your own local health decisions in Manchester because you know best, right? That's what property evolution should be about. Some of it's happened. But if you then have a dispute and you say to the Treasury or the Department of Health, well, actually, we haven't got enough. You haven't given us our fair share. We actually deserve more. Who's the arbiter of that? And I yeah. think that's one of the real big challenges of this. So, you know, we don't we still have a very centralized system, you know, even with a with a Metro Mayor model, though we've seen, I think, some examples there. So, you know, and, and actually examples, I think, with communicators like Andy Street and Andy Burnham, who are able to explain why they're doing what they're doing for their area. So I, I remember thinking about the um, the transport system in Manchester, you know, that they have moved to make it more like London buses and having yeah. a control. But Andy Burnham saying, well, I want to do this, but I can't do it straight away. It's going to take a while. And I think it's sort of it was just authentic. It sounded, you know, people understand that. Whereas, you know, in, in national government, it's it's they're, they're just simple, cheaper headlines, really, that don't actually necessarily resonate with people. And I think probably less trust as well. But I think, it, yeah, I mean, but but locally, uh, they know better, but they also need to evaluate. And I think they also it's in their own interests to do thorough detailed evaluation to prove that they can spend money effectively and get results and sometimes that's you'll get a, a queer oh, and you know a happy alignment of what government and government ministers want to achieve perhaps that party wants to achieve and what another party in a city wants to achieve you can do it cross party you know that actually more roofs over people's heads benefits the residents uh, who get the housing but also he helps government meet its targets and helps the mayor meet their targets whether or not they're of the same party yes yeah yeah um certainly that uh, there's a um uh, if we had a, a convention of mayors a little while ago and uh, bring a US mayors over to UK and one of the, the key statements from that was that there's no politics of taking the bins out, you know, it's like the bins, are, or it's like removing the bins, the bins are either there and full of the bins are there and empty uh, and it's sort of the, the local level politics in principle, if you see the empowerment does take on a, a slightly different, uh, a different angle. Um, so sort of approach, a uh, conscious about the uh, approach for Clark. I guess the sort of question to, to wrap up, and maybe this is a, a very difficult one. If there's one thing that you could change uh, in the system to try and improve um, how the government spends money on, on sort of national growth, what would that be? Uh, I think actually it is about giving local government more of their head rather than sending set. I mean, the, the only the reason to set central policy is because the manifesto's made a commitment to deliver, but it actually, if you're saying from a center, we want to build 180,000 new homes, which actually we know now government's not going to manage, that means virtually nothing to someone in my borough, uh, in Glasgow, if, well, that would perhaps not devolve, but uh, um, in, in Manchester, Liverpool, or in Sussex, it's actually the homes that are on the street next to you that you can see being built, that you know people moving into, even if it's not you, that make the difference. And that's where local councils know better. And we spend an awful lot of time uh, bidding. So in, in an ideal world, you make sure that competent local councils, maybe they have to reach a threshold to prove, just as you would with all sorts of other, it's become a bit of a trend now, hasn't it? If you prove you're competent, you get the freedom to spend. And I think that's pr probably my preferred route because you've got competent, accountable local government. You'd have no checks and balances, obviously, in place. They will deliver and keep, if they keep proving they're delivering, they they'll do well, they deliver what's wanted by their local population. And you might say, especially if you're a very dominant, a strong government with a big majority, then I suppose you could say that's <laughs> the party of government has a big majority, but it's not so strong at the moment. But you could say, well, it's actually going to be a very big priority because we know there's a housing crisis. We want you to then tell us, drill down uh, how you're going to deliver that. Of course, what you then obviously can get is, as we have seen, that housing is perhaps a good example or a bad example of this, because obviously some cases don't want to build housing in their backyard, so that can be a problem even if it's needed. But I think um, that that is where you have the checks and balances coming in. So it, it sounds easy, um, but actually we know it's much more difficult than that. But I do think giving local governments, hey, it would save a lot of money in the bidding process um, and we probably get quite good results 
The challenge would be where you get a bad results or a mad, bad or dangerous council. Do you punish the people of that area who've been ill-served? Uh, and how do you make sure that you've got those checks and balances in place? So you still have to have some reporting in. It is taxpayers' money in the end after all. But I think more freedom for local councils would be my mantra. And that's probably not my committee's exact position. Uh, but I think many of my committee colleagues would agree with me on that. Their words that land very well within the centre of the city, that's for sure. That's exactly the sort of thing that we would uh, say as well. We've reached four o'clock. That, uh, that hour went very, very quickly. Uh, dear Meg, thank you very much for, uh, for your time and your insights. Uh, they were excellent. I hope everyone else on the, on the call enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, we will have uh, a number of other events that are coming up uh, in the coming weeks, including one on investment zones. So if you haven't seen that already, please do go to the events page of our website. And we hope to see you again on a call soon. Um, Meg, thank you very much. Take care, everybody.